Hey, hello everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown coming to you for my last day from Puerto Rico. Um, but I'm going to be doing a mainland US case. This is the Ketty Cabin murders. So many people have asked me to do this one because it is one of the most horrifying murders that ever happened. It's been made into a horror movie too. Don't watch it. It not only I just watched the trailer because I hate horror movies. But I thought it was so incredibly disrespectful because they're calling it Cabin 28, where, where these, uh, this family died, um, or at least a portion of the family died. And it is, it's is—it's disgusting to me that they would make something fun out of this. And uh, along with that, every horror person wrote in the reviews that it sucked anyway. It was just terribly done. So don't go there and do that to yourself. Um, let me welcome everybody who's in the chat room. Hold on a second. <laughs> Uh, yes, I've had technical difficulties setting up again because I'm in the, my Airbnb and I didn't know that the the sunlight was going to come shining in a door. So now I have that propped with a, uh, a picture and, and a bedspread and uh, trying to keep the reflection from like <laughs> off my glasses. But <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um, let's see. Let's see who's in the chat room. Oh, goodness. Hi, Annie. You're here today. That's grand. Lila, you're here. Uh, let's see. Sarah. Sarah S is here. One, one of Sarah Sabati, yes. Or Sabetti. Sabetti, I'll get the wrong. Benny is here. Hey, Benny. I'm from Denmark. Midgey is here. Marianne is here. Oh, and you say, I've never heard of this one before. I'm looking forward to hearing your take on it. Um, you know, it's funny, even as a profile, I'd never heard of it, but apparently it is one of the most requested cases because it is so so sad and so horrific. Um Let's see, uh, Benny says, um, I only had time to watch part one of the videos that Pat referred to, so I might only know half the story. Well, let me tell you what Benny is referring to. Um, I did to do, oh, God, no, it's all of a sudden, there's mosquitoes. <laughs> oh, it's Puerto Rico. Oh, well, anyway, um, let me show you the one I referred to. Um, it's this one. Uh, the link will be below, uh, Cabin 28, The Kenny Murders. Um, uh, let, it's got two parts, um, and let me explain how that worked. So there's this fellow who actually is a horror film guy, but he does get a lot of information in these two videos. <clears throat> However, he also gets certain things that he's more interested in than others. So you always have to take any documentary and say to yourself, is there an angle he's looking at? Interestingly enough, um, he had some information elsewhere that I found very interesting that wasn't included in the video. And I'll bring that to you. Um, also, in part two, he gets a whole boatload of psychics on board. So that all is ridiculous and embarrassing. And like, guy, it's supposed to be a documentary. Why do you have like four to five different psychics? It's kind of crazy. Uh, and then the guy who put this up, if you look at this um, here, uh, there's a little little emblem, I don't know what you call that badge thing in the corner there. And it, it just says Ketty 28. Um, and if you click on the description of the video, the guy who put the video up, which is not his video, it's the other guy's video. He says some really unpleasant things about the guy who made the video and uses a whole bunch of words that I will not use. And uh, so he hated this guy who put the video, but he says, I'm putting it up because I want you to see it. And he has different theories about what he thinks went down. And when people do comment on the video, he'll come back and go, no, that's all a bunch of crap. Only with worse language. So, and I'll bring up his theory in this uh, show as well. But that's where I got a lot of my information from. However, I did find other information on the internet and I will be sharing that with you, including, uh, including the profile from John Douglas. He profiled this case, so I'll be including that as well. Um, and so, this is going to be a really interesting, um, you're going to find this case really, really fascinating. Uh, let me, let me go down and say hello to everybody else. Uh, let's see who, Allison is here. Um, uh, let's see, uh, did I say Lila? <laughs> Ms. Leah's here. Carolina is here. Um, Elisa is here. Uh, da, da, da. Martin is here from the UK. And Mickey is here. And if I miss your name, it's because I don't know where I'm at. T. Coon is here. Sherry is, Cheryl is here. And, um, Kelly is here and um, many of you others, <laughs> and I know more people will be coming in. If you would like to be in the chat room, let me do my little 
requirement here before I start the show, um, because that's important to the channel. This is an educational channel. I do not get million viewers uh, or subscribers because I don't do daily stuff on popular cases and bleed it to death, you know, more so than the victims. But you can just subscribe to the channel. That would be incredibly useful. Uh, like the video, share in any true crime group, hit the bell for notifications. And uh, if you'd like to be in the chat room, we have a patron only chat room. So you can join pay, uh, Patreon, click below, and you can come to all the chats and all my live videos. And once the show is over the live part, it does go up for public view. So everyone on my, there's no hidden uh, videos. Um, you can also support the channel by clicking the little dollar sign. And you can also buy one of my books. All right, that's that. Now, Hold on a second. The air conditioner is on and it's not working. Oh my God, I'm so hot. I have like sweating like a dog. Hold on a second. Woo, all right. Hmm, it's very unpleasant here. Oh, wow, that is really hot. <laughs> this is what happens when you do things in another location. So that, you know, things are a little bit more difficult, but I'm here anyway and uh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lila. That is absolutely correct. Subscriber quality over subscriber quantity. Yeah, it's very important to me. Um, I, I, I try, Being an educational channel, I don't just want to get a million people watching my channel because I do good gossip. I'm not there for that. So yes, I like the quality of people coming here who actually realize this. Um, wait, wait, now, 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 Tikkun, Douglas or psychic? A difference. <laughs> <laughs> That's so mean. Um, there are sometimes problems with profiling, which I have issues with, and that's what Tikkun is bringing up, that sometimes there's a lot of guesswork and not based on evidence, and therefore it's not much better than psychic stuff. And uh, I try to veer away from that, and if I, uh, you catch me doing it, point it out, because that's not what I want to happen. All right, so now let's get to this case. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. This is what I did last time, because the only way to keep cool Hi, this is Magna. It is the, oh, look at that. It's a green bottle. It's in front of my green screen. So look at that. It's disappearing. <laughs> this is Magna. This is the, let's see, premium lager of, of Puerto Rico. And it's, it's really cold. So, so I'm going to make use of it and drink it. I'm still on vacation. I mean, I'm working, but I'm on vacation. Mm -mm. Ah, all right. Now, <laughs> <laughs> Mickey says, I've got my Michelada cocktail. Oh, Michelada. I like Michelada. A lot of people don't know what that is. Um, that's um, Michelada's beer and tomato juice. And sometimes they put clam juice in it too. Michelada is really good. I, I had it for the first time in, in Mexico and I uh, haven't seen that here. Uh, but yeah, Michelada cocktail. Awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Now. What is this case? These are the four victims of this case, along with the rest of the family. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you a little short spiel and then I'm gonna go into the longer one um, because I wanna talk a little bit about the location of where this was and why that means something when you're profiling. Hold on a second. I'm, I'm a little unprepared because I was having so much issues with setting this thing up that I can't find where I'm at. Okay, hold on a second. <clears throat> All right, let me find my spot here and tell you the very, very basics. And then I'm going to give you a, a little longer version. And then all the suspects and what we should be looking for when we're analyzing this crime and why certain suspects don't come on. You know, they're not as likely as other suspects. All right, the Ketty murders are an unsolved quadruple homicide. And those are the... the over here, the four, four uh, members of the family who were killed. And it took place over the night of April 11th through 12th, 1981. So we are talking 40 years ago. And a lot of times I don't like to do what I consider historic crimes uh, because the evidence is so crappy. Uh, the information is so vague or it's, somebody's written books or they're full of garbage in them. And I, I, I can't really analyze them because I don't have anything to work with. I think there's enough here to work with, which is why I'm doing this one. So it, it was 1981. Uh, the victims were Aglena 
Susan, well, they call her Sue. So we're going to call her Sue from now on. Sue Sharp. Okay. Her daughter, Tina, down here, Tina, Tina Sharp. And then her, which one is it? That's her son. Her son is uh, John Sharp. And then John's friend, Dana Wingate, who happened to be spending the night. Now, you got to watch where you spend the night at, let me tell you. Hey, you never know what's going to happen. All right, so now it's basically what happened. The murders took place in house number 28 of the Ketty Resort. Now, this is house number 28. And this is the first thing I want to say about uh, the case, which I think is really important. Because I, I saw so much, even in this uh, documentary, which I'm like, hey, you know, let, let's, let's, be, let me straight, let's be straight here. Ketty, it's Ketty in this California. And this is their little, uh, their, their little place there. The Ketty Resort is not really quite a resort. It's where people live. Uh, it's in the town of Ketty, um, and it's in a really, really, uh, shall we say, not totally isolated, but pretty much so. A lot of lot of uh, landscape around there that is, uh, you know, if you look at the map, and I can't, I'm going to show you this uh, just for a minute here. This is San Francisco down here, and it's way out here in this area. There's a lot of hills and mountainous stuff and, and crooked roads like this and waterfalls and all kinds of stuff. It's not exactly where you go for, yeah, you know, great work options or it's not like, you know, it's, it's not a suburb of a city. It's not a city. It's a small town in the middle of pretty much bumfuck nowhere. Okay. So that's the reality. Now, however, a bunch of stuff has been said which I disagree with as far as understanding where they live. Uh, when you, for example, when you go through uh, the videos, you see a lot of people and they're saying these kind of things. We have a wonderful town. This has never happened here before. Well, you know, most towns don't have quadruple homicides. I don't care where you live. It's, that's an unusual thing. Um, and if you remember the Clutter family, you know, uh, they, they were murdered in the middle of, absolutely nowhere in a farmhouse. So anything can happen anywhere, all right? It doesn't matter where you live. If you get one bad person or two bad people in an area, that'll do you. Um, so they're going on, oh my God, this is, no, it's a wonderful place to live and it's so sweet and da, 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 da. And then if you wait a little longer in the video, they start trashing people, <laughs> you know? So you're like, how wonderful was it? All right, so here's the reality. This place, um, the, especially the the place which which uh, the family lived in these different cabins. They were small cabins. They were cheap. Okay. So the mom. Let me tell you what the mom did. She had moved out. She had. Uh, let me show you a picture of um of the the family. Hold on a second. Um. Okay. This is this is the family. Uh, she had five children. She left her husband on the east coast and came out west um, to get away from him, supposedly, because he was abusive. I have no clue. But she's a single mom now with five children. It doesn't seem that she's getting a lot of money. So she moves into a cabin like this, which has basically two bedrooms. So let me say this. She wasn't doing well financially. I'm not saying it. I'm not knocking her for that. I'm just saying. Sometimes when you have these isolated locations, You'll have things like, have you ever seen those motels um, that's, that um, rent by the week, by the month? Yeah, they do. You know why they do that? Because the people living in them can't find other places to live and don't have enough money. And let me tell you a story. And, I, and I've had a few people, not some haters, but they complained, why do you tell personal stories? Why don't you just get to the point? I'll tell you why. Because each one of us has had some different experiences in life. And those experiences can t tell other people something about, you know, a situation they don't understand or are not familiar with. For example, if somebody wants to tell me about how uh, what it was like to be popular in high school, have at it because <laughs> I was a, an untouchable in high school. I have no clue what it's like to be popular. I didn't go to the prom. You know, my high school years sucked. They truly sucked. So I don't know what it's like to be popular in high school. I also am not really good at networking. So even though I'm in, in have been in television for years, or 15 years of television work, people say, oh my God, have you met so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? And I'm like, quite frankly, no. 
my friends, when I go to the studio where I uplink from, I, I know the limo driver, the the, the uh, security guard, and the makeup artist. Because I don't network well with the people that are on TV. So I don't understand that stuff. So I think it's important to be willing to hear a little bit about what other people have experienced so that you can understand a particular situation. So these people move to a place they could afford. Now, I, I did have a really interesting experience. I want to tell you this because it's funny too. Okay, so I was writing my book, uh, The Murder of Cleopatra, and I lived in Maryland and in in, in, in outside of Washington, D.C., um, in Prince George's County. And I was in my house going insane. I couldn't seem to uh, focus, uh, get getting distracted for whatever reasons. And I made this decision. I'm like, okay, what I'm going to do is go to a place where I will not be distracted. And just almost like, I think it was 10 miles from my house, there was this, there's this hotel. Um, well, like, it's not really a motel. In the middle of the strip, you know, the, 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 it's, it's in the, it's so like the, the lanes go this way and the lanes go that way. And they stuck this whole hotel in the middle, or motel. All right. It was a pretty shabby place. And um, you could rent by the week. So I made this decision. I'm going to pay for this room for the week. They don't have any internet. So, and this was a while back. This is 2000, I don't know, 20 years ago. Anyway, they didn't have internet there. And it was a crappy place. And there was a new place to go around it. So I'm like, this will be great. I will be forced to write. <laughs> so I checked into the, this motel and I'm in there and in this really crappy room and there really is nothing to do. So I started working and it was going quite well. Uh, but then, you know, the, the television studio called me and said, you know, we want to take you to the studio. And so I had them pick me up and they're like pulled in and they're like, why the hell are you here? Because, <laughs> and then when they brought me back, they're like, do you really want us to leave you here? Because it turned out there were a lot of crack hoes there and uh, people going either going to prison or coming from prison. And <laughs> it was a not so great place. I did finish the book there. I, I have to admit, I totally finished the book and, and I made enough. It was an interesting enough place to write another book. <laughs> so, so those places exist. And when I was out in California, um, uh, I was pregnant and moved to California. My husband was in a program there. We ended up in a, a location in California. Uh, it was only 200 bucks a week and we stayed in a, it was a second, it was one of these wooden kind of apartments that come off the street in California, little, little, not a balcony, but a little walkway around it. We were on the end one, um, 200 bucks a month. We could afford that while we we're in the program. And it was an interesting location. There were a lot of people there on welfare. There were a lot of single moms there. Uh, there were a lot of criminals there. <laughs> and uh, most people made sure that when, the, they put all their belongings. If you open the door like this, all the belongings were on this side, so they're hidden when you open the door. Um, but there were times when people got robbed and then somebody would walk out of their apartment and go, who the heck took my stuff? And somebody would yell, it was John down there. So she'd go back to John and she'd go, John, you took my stuff? Yeah. Can I have my TV back? Yeah. What about my money? Oh, I took that. I already spent it. Okay, John. <laughs> this is, these are ways people live. Okay. Now in these neighborhoods where people are struggling, uh, there's good people there and they are trying to survive. And there are also people who are a little more questionable that come through these communities. And what you see is after a while, there are, there's, there's, there's claims of drug running in this area. There's claims of, uh, well, she was a single mom. There were lots of stories about her. Um, one of the suspects who lived a couple of doors down, he was at, on the outs with his wife and he had psychiatric problems and his friend was there with him who had been a criminal and also had psychiatric problems. This is what happens. Then there's va uh, vagrants that come through. So every town has its issues. So when we look at a crime, we have to say, what could have happened? Could a vagrant have come through? Sure. Could, it, could, it, could there be a, a revenge killing in this town because somebody's mad at somebody? Absolutely. Could it be a robbery? Some people said, oh, who's going to rob anybody in this town? We don't have any money. But I just explained to you. Hey, <laughs> I, I was in, if anybody's been there, uh, Long Beach, Pacific Coast Highway. Somebody went in that woman's house and stole her TV. And I think it was, but I don't know, money from her welfare check or whatever. They, they, they found something. And when you don't have anything, $10 or something. 
So you got to be realistic. So yes, could it have been a robbery gone wrong? Sure. Could it have just been a thrill crime? Absolutely. So we have to start out being willing to be a little open-minded and not just go, well, that couldn't have happened here. Yeah, it could have. Okay, so I just wanted to bring that up because too many people don't understand if they don't have never lived in certain areas that are a little bit impoverished, um, even, when, even when you're living in the greatest town ever, stuff happens, you know? So it's not even just the impoverished town. You could be in a great place and you still have the crazy neighbor, still have the robbery, still have the vengeance crimes, and still have the serial killer. You know, no one is safe 100% of the time. So that's what I want to say before I get into all of this. All right, all right, hold on. <laughs> oh my gosh, like I have the air conditioner on to as low as that air conditioner goes. It's not working. Hmm. Oh, look, I can drink out of a bottle that doesn't exist. See? <laughs> that's cool. Okay. <laughs> Leslie says, Pat, you are truly a teacher. I love when people share experiences. That is how we learn. Thank you, Leslie. I think that's true. I learn from other people. When they tell me stuff, I'm like, wow, I, I had no clue. That's not a culture I'm familiar with or uh, uh, or whatever. It's not a, 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 a um, profession I'm experienced with or it's not. Just, an, just an, I just don't know. I mean, we can't experience everything in life. We got our, our little area that we know. And then there's stuff that we're clueless on. <laughs> okay. Annie Haley says, we're stay at motels with naked ladies on the carpet. <laughs> okay. You're going to, I now I have to, now I have to tell them about this. I, I got to get to the crime, but I have, I do have to say something about this. Okay. So wait a minute. Hold on a second. I got to, you're going to wonder what Annie Haley is talking about. So I was on a book tour way back in 2003 and I, my car broke down and because my car broke down I had to get a tow truck to take me in and while the tow truck was taking me in I ended up in in the car on the bed of the truck doing a radio show because it's the only place that was quiet but then they put they took me to the only hotel in town that was near the place I was fixing my car um and it was called what was it the White House Motel motel or something like that. Anyway, I pull in the parking lot and people are sitting on their cars and they're drinking Old English 800. And uh, okay, I like an Old English 800. I have terrible taste sometimes. Anyway, so they're drinking, they're all drinking on top of their cars. I'm like, oh, this is a nice place. <laughs> but it was close to where my car was getting fixed. And I had a, I had a television show in the morning. And so <laughs> I opened the doors with my sis. So I opened the door, opened the door to the the a motel hotel, I don't know what they call it. And on the floor was this like, uh, this carpeting with pink naked ladies on it, all over the carpets. <laughs> and that went along with the fact there was no doorknob on the, on the, the uh, bathroom door and the fact that the, the phone was smashed. Other than that, the place was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually in Ohio. So Annie Haley, who is in Ohio, actually knows the place. <laughs> okay. All right. To the story. We're getting highly sidetracked with all this interesting stuff. So now I'm going to show you something very important. All right. And I want you to keep this in mind for the rest of the show. All right. You're not going to know what this means till the end, till the end of the show which is not my way to suck you into staying. It's just, I don't want to tell you why this is important now, but it is important. Okay, so what we have here, this is Ketty, all right? This is, I wanna show you where it is. In, this is San Francisco and up here is Ketty, okay? And it goes around like this to this location. And you wonder what is that location? This is a location called Feather Falls. And if you see what it says, uh, you can go two ways, but three hours and 42 minutes from Ketty to this place called uh, Feather Falls, and this will, it's three hours and something the other direction. All right, keep this in mind because this is where the girl that was taken from the house, the 12 year old girl was taken from the house, and they didn't find a body for three years. It was found here. And this is very important, and I'll explain that to you later. Let's go to the crime scene itself, okay? And I am not going to show you the crime scene photos because they're very gory. I'll the link is below. You want to go look at them. You can look at them on your own time. Um, I'm going to explain just, I'm not even going to explain in detail. It's not necessary, but let me say this. It was pretty nasty. Okay. So 
there, let me explain what happened that day. All right. Now, the murders took place in house 28 of the Ketty Resort, which is not a resort, but mostly a place where people live. The bodies of Sue, John, and Dana, not the little 12-year-old girl, were found on the morning of April 12 by Sue's 14-year-old daughter, Sheila, who had been sleeping at a friend's house. And what happened there, which was really sad, uh, there was a lady uh, in the video. Uh, Sheila went to stay at her, the, her house. That lady did a lot of what I would do. Uh, she, liked, she liked her children to be able to associate with other kids. And she liked other kids to have an opportunity to associate with her kids. But she said, I won't let my kids go to her house because I don't trust what goes on there. And I've done that with my kids throughout their lives. I'm like, look, I'm not trying to be mean, but no, I'm not letting you go over there because single mom, I don't know who her boyfriends are and what else is going on over there. You can't stay there. Uh, I, unless I trust them implicitly, you're not going to stay there. You can't go play there. You can't stay overnight there. You're, those kids can come to my house. And guess what? Most of the time they did. <laughs> Why did the parents send them to my house? Because they trusted us. Um, they trusted my husband and they trusted me and, and we were homeschooling and they, they thought we were just a nice family and they didn't mind getting rid of their kids so they could party. Okay. So their kids came to our house, but we didn't let our kids go to their house. So Sheila went to the neighbor's house and her, the other girl was supposed to go there too, the younger sister. Uh, so she was like 14 and, uh, and the younger sister, Tina's like 12. They're both supposed to go there and they often did, but at that supposedly Sheila claimed that she like she wanted her sister to go home because she wanted this private time, not always have her sister around, which is understandable. Later on, one of these guys uses that as a reason to say that Sheila, the 14 year old was involved in the murders, which I think is ludicrous. Uh, but anyway, so Tina went home about 10 o'clock, um, which is unfortunate because she ended up at the house. Now, let's say what else happened. Okay, Sue, this, Sue's, uh, uh, let's say, Sue's two younger sons, remember there's two younger sons that did not get murdered. They were at the house and they had their friend, Justin Smart. And this is important because Justin Smart is the son, the stepson of one of the major suspects. Uh, his, his name is Marty Smart. He lived two houses away. It gets a little confusing, but I'll try to clear it up for you. So anyway, the three boys were hanging out together and then they went to sleep together in one of the rooms. In the next room was the mom, Sue. She was staying in there because the other girl was not there. And Tina, the girl that ended up disappearing from the house. So you had five kids, five of them in the house at that point. Now you say, what happened to the older boy and his buddy? Okay, the older boy and his buddy, um, let me change, let me change sites now here because there's a really good explanation of this elsewhere. And I want to use that site because it's it's very use, it's very clear. All right. So here's what goes on. The oldest boy, John, and his buddy Dana spent the day in Quincy. Quincy is like, this is Ketty. Quincy's like about about here, but it's not showing on this map. Uh, it's nearby. I guess a bigger town. <laughs> okay. Um, on April 11th, in 1981, Sue and the kids were in and out of cabin 28 throughout the day. A neighborhood boy, Justin, they call him Ethan here, but that's, that's uh, he's the stepson of Marty Smart, but his mom was Ethan, I guess. Uh, he would spend the night with Sue's two younger sons. The three youngsters were hanging out at the house since, since the afternoon. The oldest boy, John, and his buddy, Dana, had spent the day in Quincy. Around 1.30 p.m., Sue and her oldest daughter, Sheila, went to pick up John and Dana and Quincy. Then at 3.30 p.m., the two teenagers headed out again. They had planned to return home later that night. Now this, I want to point this something out here. Some people say that Sue was kind of a laissez-faire mother, you know, she wasn't paying much attention to her kids. She had a lot of male friends. They say there were drugs involved. I don't know if any of this is true, but I do know in the 1980s, people let the kids run a little bit more than perhaps today. Um, so, but the boy Dana was in a group home. There's a little bit about him in that video. And his dad sounds like, well, yeah, I'm like, your son's in a group home. And he doesn't even talk about that. So I'm going to say something's wrong in your house, that your son is in a group home. There's the, there's the criminal acts he committed. And there's some other stuff claimed about him, which I'm not going to get into, but he was living in a group home. Now, 
this would pretty much mean that John, um, if they're hanging, he's hanging out with Dana, can't go stay with his buddy in the group home. I don't know that they allowed that, but the, the group home, uh, they told the group home that they had a, they, that Dana asked for permission to go stay with John at his home, which he had to do, which was proper. And it was accepted. So the group home knew he was gonna stay at John's. The mom said, don't hitchhike back which is interesting because I'm not sure how the hell she thought they were going to get there. <laughs> you know, I mean, she wasn't giving them a ride. Was the group home giving them a ride? Was Dana's father giving a ride? Who's giving these boys a ride home? Apparently nobody. So I'm not sure how you say, don't hitchhike and then don't give them a way to get home. So anyway, she urged him not to hitchhike, but a passerby spotted John and Dana on a street corner trying to flag a ride home around 9.30 to 10 that evening. So you have these teenage boys out there in the dark. Um, and it's really questionable when they actually got home. Um, I do have, let's see if I, let me, let me just point that out because I think it's important. Uh, I'm going to find it. Uh, hold on here. Uh, I'm hoping I recognize these little, it's in very little teeny. Uh, where is it? Maybe this. Nope, that's not it. Okay, where did it go? Okay, that's not it. Hold on a second. I'm trying to find it. Aha. Okay. Okay. So supposedly if you get to 930, okay, nine o'clock, Johnny and Dana are on the way home, supposedly. 930, some people see them near the van gas station. They talk about a party at Mount Hoff, I guess. They 10 to 1015, David and Joey see them again and drive past. Okay. 11 p.m., Johnny's neighbors, Kevin and Connie, see Johnny and Dana heading, hitchhiking back to Quincy. Why are they going back to Quincy? They're supposed to be going to Ketty. But, or standing on the wrong side of the road for whatever reasons. The last reliable sighting is 10 to 15 p.m. Reliable sighting. That means they were not in a vehicle going anyplace until at least after 10, 15 p.m. Estimated time of death for all three victims is midnight to 3 a.m. Now... Tina, who is tossed out by Sheila to go home. Hey, I want to be with my friend. Go away, your little sister. She goes home at 10 o'clock. These boys are still out there somewhere running around on the roads. All right, the two boys. Meanwhile, the three boys and Tina and Sue, the mom, are all at home. So there's five of them in the house. And at some point, the three boys go to sleep. And Tina and, and uh, mom go to sleep. When the boys get there, we do not know. We don't know if they got there before the crime occurred or after the crime occurred. There's no way to know that. So just understand that people start, you know, giving theories on that. We just actually don't know. All right. So then what happens is, all right. Okay, hold on a second. Um, it's a very small house, by the way. So, Next, we have this. All right, the next morning around 7 a.m., Sheila returns home from, her, from the sleepover, which is just a couple houses away. Oh, it's next door, actually. When she opened the front door to the living room, she discovered a massacre. Blood was everywhere. The living room was in complete chaos, and Sue, John, and, and John's friend Dana were dead on the floor. Electrical cording and medical tape was bound around their wrists and ankles. They were tied up, okay? Uh, after she saw the gruesome scene, she ran back to next door and got to get help. And they went back and found that the three boys were still alive, okay? Rick, Greg, and their friend, Justin, they were still alive. Seemingly, they just slept through it or weren't aware of it or whatever. Or they just didn't want to acknowledge it. Now, police arrived at 8 a.m., began their investigation. All right, now let me tell you the basics of what happened to them. Uh, Sue and John had suffered, oh, okay, wait a minute. Uh, Sue and John had suffered similar types of wounds. Their throats were slashed and they both had multiple stabbings and blunt force trauma to the head. Dana had severe head injuries, but also had been strangled. Sue was gagged deeply with a bandana and her own underwear. Tape securing the gag was in place. She was naked from the waist down because they used her underwear for a gag. Uh, and there was no sign of sexual assault. This is really important. No sign of sexual assault. She's 35 years old. Didn't look that bad. <laughs> She's a thin lady. You know what I'm saying? 
just just to be realistic. Yeah, the kind of guy, girl that, a woman that a sexual predator will be perfectly happy attacking, even though they do not mind sometimes heavier women or elderly women. I better watch out. Okay, so anyway, uh, her, her legs were initially splayed apart. Okay, we don't know. This is some, this is some stuff that's not necessarily so. Uh, someone had moved her and covered her with a yellow blanket. She was covered with a yellow blanket, but there's a, there's a reason for this. It's unclear how this happened or who did it. This is true. Okay, very, very brutal crime. They found two bloody knives and a hammer and a plastic piece from a BB gun. The weapons included a steak knife that came from Sue's kitchen. They also found a bloody footprint, foot, uh, sorry, fingerprint on the handrail leading down the back door. Okay, so blood was all over the victims, the floors, the walls, the ceilings, both bedroom doors, yada, yada. Um, here is the really important point of this, which I want to point out. There was also uh, blood on, on, on Sue's feet, uh, which, in, which a lot of people say is because she walked in the blood, but I see no evidence that there were any footprints on the floor. So I personally believe that she did not walk in the blood, that her feet leaned on something that was bloody near her and then she was turned over. Now, whether she turned over herself whether somebody pushed her over, I don't know. Again, this, these are the kind of things that people overemphasize when they don't actually know because crazy things happen at crimes. Uh, people can flip around a lot in, in de desperation. They'd be fighting, trying to survive. And then some people, sometimes the killers just chuck them around or kick them. <laughs> they do stuff to them. Some people say that these bodies were posed on the floor. I don't believe any of that. I believe that they just ended up dead where they ended up dead. So, but the question is, why? Why would somebody come in in the wee hours of the morning and, and believe me, um, these people were tied up before they were murdered, which is also important. Because we're not talking about a case where somebody just came in and killed everyone. They tied them up and then murdered them. And then the youngest daughter, Tina, disappeared from the house. Not to be found for three years. And her body was then found at Feather Falls. It's a very isolated location, which takes about three hours down these really the back roads from Ketty. Okay, that's a, that's the basics of the story. Now, I want to get to the suspects and the motive of this murder. And here again, we have to be really careful about what we believe. Now, let me tell you, there's there's a bunch of let me tell you the basic concepts of the motive. One is somebody wanted it kidnapped Tina and killed the rest of them. Another is somebody was pissed off at Sue, the mom, and killed everybody and then took the kid for some reason unknown. Robbery, they, it's true they didn't have any money, but who knows what they thought was there or just a thrill kill. Okay, um, those are the basics. Now, let's look at what Justin, the one surviving, uh, well, one of the surviving boys, what he had to say. Let me show you some other pictures while I'm at it. Uh, there's a couple of the, the uh, weapons. Of the, there was a hammer and there was a steak knife that was bent. So uh, it obviously, um, yeah, this is a snake, steak knife that was bent. So some really se severe stabbing went on. All right. Now, they did some uh, uh, polygraphs with um, Justin's stepfather, Martin, and uh, he supposedly passed that. Uh, his wife, Mar Marilyn, who he had lots of issues with, and she had lots of issues with him, um, she said that he hated John. So she's saying that her husband might have done it because he hated John. And she also said that she saw her husband burning something in the fireplace in the wee hours of the morning. And this is important because what she's trying to claim is that her husband... Okay, let me tell you. Let me tell you the big theory on on, on Justin. Let me show you who the, who these guys are. Um, okay, so now so we got all these dead people. We got three kids that survived, and people say, why did why did nobody kill the boys? Maybe they didn't know they were there. Some people say, oh, because one of the killers was the stepfather of one of the boys. All right, so let's take a look at this. Oh, by the way, here are the boys that were killed, um, and and along with. 
the mom, and then Tina is the one that was, that was taken away. All right, now, he, these are, to this day, the number one suspects in the crime. All right, this is, um, this is, um, I just forgot his name. <laughs> Sorry, I'm blanking on his name. Oh. I'd say help me, but okay. Marty, 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 Marty Smart. Okay, Marty. His name is Marty Martin. Okay, he's the number one suspect. Why? He lived two doors down, and apparently, here's here's all the theories. He was having an affair with Sue, and his wife found out about it. So, in order to please his wife, he killed Sue and whomever was there. That's one theory. Another theory is that Sue told his wife, Marilyn, hey, your, your husband is an abusive, creepy dude. You don't want to dump him. And so he killed, he killed, he went over there to kill Sue because she, tr she tried to get his wife to leave him. All right, possibly. Now, at the time that this went on, he's living, he's living two, two houses down. He's living with this guy. I'm just going to call him Bo because I can't remember his whole full name. Um, Bo. Uh, this dude is a friend of his from both of them in mental institutions. Uh, this guy is a criminal, has not a criminal history, and he's a mental institution. So anyway, he shows up like a month before and starts living at the house. They claim he's got, he's got connections to the mob in, in Chicago and the drug dealer. Lots, lots of claims. Um, and so, he, you know, it's kind of unsavory fellow. So the concept is he got pissed. These two, whoa, do you, hear, do you like we hear the party happening now outside? <laughs> I just hear people screaming and clapping now outside the Airbnb. I mean. Okay, so these guys supposedly go to a bar that night and they want Sue to go with them and Sue says no. So then they come home and some time after they get home, which is up like two o'clock in the morning, these two guys then decide to kill off the Sue. Okay, Sue, because that, that's, where the, that's where the hatred is. They, well, not, not Bo, Bo could care less about anything. But hey, Marty is mad at Sue, even though he's supposedly having either an affair with her or she's pissing off him because of his wife. I, who knows? But anyway, he, he's pissed at her. So he's going to go kill her. All right. So he and Bo go in and tie everybody up, kill them, and then take Tina and do something with her. Um, which people don't know what they do and where she was because somebody took her out of the house and it wasn't for three years before her body was found. Uh, her body was found in that place I was showing you on the map, uh, Feather Falls. Um, and so they finally found her skull and her bones, but purely by a crazy accident because um, it was a very isolated place. Uh, they found her and so, where if, if Marty and Bo took her, gosh knows where she was, because if the wife of, okay, let's go back to, um, let's go back to Marty and Bo, just so that you're a little bit of pig. Okay, so his wife says, Marilyn says, that he was burning something in a fireplace like that, that early in the morning. So if that was true, he couldn't have been taking Tina three some hours away to, to get rid of her. So where the heck was Tina? Now, later on, Mar Marilyn in this video says, oh, well, I found a bloody jacket of Tina's in some sh something on their property. So maybe he was storing her out there before he took her someplace else. But there's no evidence that that's true. Um, as far as I know, there's no proof that that was her jacket, there was blood on it, none of that. There's no proof on it. So uh, Marilyn seems like a pretty much of a bitter, bitter ex-wife who is pissed off at her husband and uh, so are her kids. Um, that her uh, her daughter doesn't like him, and probably for good reason. <laughs> that guy sounds like a psychopath to me. Doesn't mean he killed his family. Does not. And this is where it gets really complicated. All right. So, what would lead one to think that he killed the family? All right. He was brought in for questioning right away. Uh, they went to his house. They they searched everything. They came up nothing that linked him to the crime. He hadn't left town. So if he didn't leave town, Tina had to still be around somewhere there because she wasn't in the house. So he, she'd have to be on his property or somewhere. They, they had access to his vehicle. 
Um, this guy didn't drive, so I have a car. So it was his vehicle. They would have checked his vehicle and they didn't come up with anything. Nothing linked him to the crime. They gave him a, a polygraph. He passed. Also, he passed. So they kind of dropped him as, as a suspect. Now, that's interesting because if you watch this video, you'll find out that later on, he said some things that were kind of questionable. Both of these dudes split town after the crime. Um, and a lot of, I'm guessing his wife just basically told him to go to hell, get out of there. Uh, this guy would just go anyplace. So those two guys split town. He eventually starts going to he, he, going to a therapist. And meanwhile, he writes some letter to his wife that says, well, you know, I did everything for you. Even the, I took four lives for you. There are four lives I was responsible for that for you. And people say, oh, my God, that proceeds. He said he killed four people. Some of the people say, no, he actually, there was some issue about in his later life, that, and or, I'm sorry, his earlier life that he had left a family or something, gave up his kids or something. Personally, I think he was talking about the crime. Now, he talks to a therapist, and this is in part two of the, um, the video. And the therapist comes across as very credible. He confesses to the therapist, shall we say, confessing. He sees the ther therapist like seven times. And then like the sixth time he sees, sees the therapist, he says, you know that, that case down in Ketty? It was me. I killed the two, the, girl, the, the woman and her daughter, but I didn't kill the two guys. That's kind of creepy, right? So, of course, the, the therapist, uh, actually, amazingly, even though it's confidential, does the right thing and contacts the police. Nothing ever comes of it. Now, there are many people who think that's proof. Oh, and let me tell you something else he said. Right after the crime happened, they were interviewing him, and they were saying hammers were used in the crime. And he goes, oh, you know, I got this hammer that went missing from my, from my house. It was outside, and it went missing. And they're like, why would he say that? Except that he's trying to say he didn't commit. The, no, somebody, if the crime was committed with his hammer, it's because somebody stole it. These are all reasonable things to think. But here's the thing. One of the problems you have with people who are psychopathic is they'll lie about everything. <laughs> they'll lie to get out of trouble. They'll, get li they'll lie and get into trouble. They'll lie just to see what your reaction is. They'll lie to claim things they didn't do. It's also got, he's supposed to got other psychiatric problems, but it's very possible that when he's chatting with the police, he's like, oh, you know, it's done with the hammer. Oh, no, it's mine. I just see a hammer that's missing. Oh, yeah, mine wasn't missing. He could just be saying crap. He tells his wife, oh, you know what? Those right? four lies for you. Who says they're saying? He's just making that stuff up to make her go, oh, my God, you care for people for me? What's in his little mind? Now, why do you say what do you tell the therapist this? Well, you know, when certain people go to therapists, they like to play with therapists, especially psychopaths, which I think he is. And they like to see the reaction from the psychopath. I mean, so, sorry, from the, <laughs> which, I'm not saying that for the therapist. They like to see the reaction from the therapist. They like to play with people's minds. So he goes, oh, I, uh, yeah, I killed, I killed, I killed the woman and I killed the kid uh, and the girl. And I hit her in the head with a hammer, which is not true. Because Tina was found, when her body was found, well, not her body, her skull was found and bones were found, her skull was not hit with a hammer. There were no injuries to any of the bones in her body. So likely she was strangled. So he wasn't telling the truth about that. So the question is, was he telling the truth about anything? Or was he just playing around? So now you ask me, he's such a good suspect though. Wow, how could you think he didn't commit this crime? All right. I'm going to tell you why I, I, I'm not taking him off the suspect list. I'm lowering him on the suspect list. Here's why. Of all the people that would know what was going on in, the, in, in, in that household, okay, in cabin 28, he would know his own son went to stay there for the night. Now, <laughs> here's what makes no sense. If he wanted to get back at Sue, I'm pretty sure he could have killed Sue at any old time and not taken out any of the kids. I'm pretty sure that if you know your kid is spending the night over there, this is not a good time to go kill off the entire family when your son can, can, can watch what happened. And as a matter of fact, his son was, he was um, 
poly, he was uh, not polygraphed. He was hypnotized, and he gave statements about what happened that night. Now, mind you, they're a little, still a little messed up. Let me show you what his son's statements are. Okay, Justin, if you look further, as time went on, well, Justin changed his story. Okay, well, he did quite a few times. Uh, he told the investigators he was asleep during the murders, as were the other two boys, and did not hear anything. That was the original that his the stepson said, Justin. Another time, he said he did see the murders. He said he woke, they, he was woken up. He got up and looked through the door into the living room, and he saw a shoe sharp laying on the sofa, and there were two men standing in the middle of the room. Not unlikely. Uh, there were uh, definitely, in my opinion, two men involved in this crime. There's no way they could have controlled all of those people. I can, but it's not likely. And this is a kind of crime that one urges the other on, and kind of like it. It's like a, they set a fire between the two of them. And so, yes, I think two men were involved. But was it these two men? Not necessarily. Okay, let's see what else he said. All right, so then he said, this is his next statement, that um, that John Sharp came into the room again, arguing with the two men. A fight broke out, and Dana tried to escape out through the kitchen. But the man with the brown hair hit him with a hammer. John was attacked by the man with the black hair and soon tried to help John. At this point, he said he hid behind the door. He then saw the men tying up John and Dana. He also claimed he saw Tina come into the living room holding a blanket and asking what was going on. I think that's fascinating because a yellow blanket was found on top of her mother. The two men grabbed her and took her out the back door as Tina tried to call for help. He said the man with the black hair used a pocket knife to cut Sue in the middle of the chest, which she was stabbed in the middle of the chest. Um, and this, so this is all true. I think he did see something. Uh, I like the part where Tina comes out with the yellow blanket because it was found on top of Tina. I mean, on top of Sue, the mom. And people, there's people who say, oh, you know, uh, the guys felt sorry about this and blah, 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 remorse stuff. I don't quite buy that. But I do believe if they had killed all three of them and Tina came out because, or they found her and made her come out and she was hiding in the blanket and she saw her mother, they might have just grabbed the blanket and thrown it over her mother and said, we're taking you and grabbed her and went out the back door. That's what I believe happened. I believe they were all tied up and they were all killed and Tina came out with it, exactly what Justin said. Um, because that makes sense. Um, so that they would have thrown the blanket over her mom just to calm her down for a second while they pulled her out the door. I'll go with that. Not because they felt remorse or because they couldn't look at the naked lady but just because that helped them get out the door with Tina. And you ask, why did they take Tina? Okay, I'm gonna to get to that in a little bit. All right, so now we have, we have a woman to point out, mom was not raped. She was tied up and murdered just like the boys. Now, so, the, the, so obviously the purpose of the crime wasn't rape. Why would somebody come in then and kill all three? What was the purpose? Well, one could say he was pissed off at Sue. He didn't care about raping her. He just wanted her dead. He wanted to see her boys die. Or, well, there was an extra boy, but, you know, collateral damage. Maybe. But I look again. Would you pick that night when your son was sleeping over to kill three people? Son's friends, son's friends and the son's friend mother, you know, really? Um, and Justin never, ever. His stepson never, ever said it was him. Now, some people, like the guy who put up the videos who claims that Justin was involved in the crime, as, as was Justin's mom. Everybody was involved, like six people were involved. Justin helped kill everybody or tie them up. And he's, that's why he's not writing them out. But, you know, come on now. Really? Would you really need to, you know, if you wanted to kill off Sue, would you really need to involve your stepson so he can rat you out? Because it's your stepson. It's not even, oh, hold on a second. My butt hurts. I'm on a really hard chair. <laughs> hold on a second. Oh my God, that hurts. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, would you, if it, were, if it were your son and you were a psychopath, maybe you take the chance. Your stepson, stepsons aren't that crazy about you anyway, you know? They'll rat you out to their mom. Justin never ever said that he saw his dad there. I don't for a minute believe that if it was his dad, that he, his stepdad that he saw, that he wouldn't have said something. But he never said it was his stepdad. So I don't understand. So you're, this guy lives two houses away and he's gonna commit a massive crime like that right around the corner from where he lives. 
and there's no evidence found in his house or in his vehicle. His own stepson doesn't ride him out. I say nonsense. And this is why these two, in spite of the fact they're squirrely, creepy dudes, I don't think committed the crime. All right, I don't. Uh, I, could, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't see that it makes sense that they committed the crime and no evidence was ever linked. Now, there are those out there who say, oh, that's because the sheriff in town was his best buddy and they were all been a big drug thing together. I don't buy that either. Because they had, not only did the sheriff work on the case, but they had Department of Justice people in here working on the case. And I'm sure they weren't going to cover. And even the sheriff, really? You're going to cover for a guy who just, the good sheriff had been friend with him for a little bit. He tried to help him out. But if he went and killed a woman, two, two teenage boys and a little girl, the sheriff is going to cover for that? I don't think so. So these guys, shaky, in my opinion, as that they had anything to do with this crime. Uh, did, he, did he claim things? Yeah, he did. But none of them, I think, pan out. I think he just thought it was funny to make those claims. All right. So I'm going to go on to John Douglas's uh, uh, profile next. And then I'm going to give you my conclusion of who I think is the most likely person to commit the crime. But let me check on your comments and so I can have a taste of my oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get comfy. Uh, my beer while you do that. Okay, let's see. What have you got to say here? All right. Uh, Mitch says, I have at least two hammers in my house, but couldn't tell you right now if either or both were missing. Why volunteer that info to the police? All right, I'm going to explain that. I'm not saying he's not a psychopath, okay? Psychopaths have this weird way of like liking to make, say stuff that's really stupid just because, literally just because. That's why. And, and, and this is what confuses, you know, an, uh, when you're doing an investigation, one of the uh, statements I've always made is, if the guy's a psychopath, is he trying to lie himself out of the crime? Or is he just lying and getting himself looked at as the criminal? Because he likes to play those games. So it's hard to know which way he goes with it. So, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What hammers do I... I I think I have one hammer. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to think, but that's that's why. Um, wait, let me, let me go back up here because I see a funny comment I want to make a comment on. Hold on a second. Uh, oh, well, goodness gracious. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, it's an interesting point. Baby Sue was not raped because the boys came back suddenly. No, she was tied up in a way that you can't rape her. That's why. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and if they tied up the boys, why can't they rape her? What? They're worried about the way the boys feel about her? <laughs> that they're going to see her, them rape her? Yeah, I don't think that's that's an issue. First of all, they can kill the boys and then rape her and then kill her. Or they can rape her and won't let the boys watch and then kill all of them. But she was tied up in a way that is like precludes most rape uh, and sexual assault. So they seem to have zero interest in that whatsoever, which is very interesting to me. <laughs> and he says, Lighthouse Motel in Toledo, Ohio. Too sure. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Mitchie says, I've always wanted to stay in one of those seedy American motels with a coin operated vibrating beds. And let me tell you, the Lighthouse Motel did have a vibrating bed for, with the quarters. They took my quarters and didn't give me the vibrating bed. I was so sad. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, uh, true and not true. Elisa says it was very telling when this lady said she did not approve her kids to go to Sue's house. This is true, but it doesn't mean that she thought they were going to be murdered at Sue's house, but just that she didn't know what was going on at Sue's house. And I had friends of my kids. I can't say that the mothers were hanging out with squirrely men, but I didn't know. And I wasn't going to let my kids go there. I just did not know. As a good mother, I felt, I'm sorry, if I don't know the parents or the parent very well, that I trust them as much as I trust myself, they're not going there. So I thought that was a wise mom. Um, let's say, uh, uh, Benny says, I did not understand if the hammer and knives that were inside that cabin were the murder weapons. As I read, there was another hammer and I think another ham life that was found, knife. 
that was found sometime later in another location. Yes, Benny, let me let me get to that. All right, so here, this is what you're talking about. Okay, so later, later on, like, like I was a decade, decade and a half, two decades later, this hammer was found in a pond nearby and this knife was found. They were both rusted. There's no proof that either one of those uh, uh, tools were, were involved in the crime, but they were nearby. And here's where you don't want to jump to conclusions. There are a lot of tools in life that get flung around everywhere for whatever reasons. They do. And so unless you can get DNA, something blood on there that matches, we just don't know. And so, yes, those did exist, but I, I wouldn't call that monumental. Let me put it that way. Um, uh, Andini says, I thought it was sad that she wouldn't let Tina stay the night because she wanted to. I don't think so. You know how tired you get of your little damn sister, <laughs> you know, or your little brothers or whatever. You want to just be with your friend and then you've got the, a third person there. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to be part of this. No, teenagers do not really like younger sisters hanging out with them sometimes. And she usually did hang out with them. And this time Sheila said, let me have some me time with my friend. I don't think that's wrong. Um, so Tina went home. It was next door. You know, it's like not like a crisis situation. Although it was claimed that Sheila sent Tina home by some. Sheila, Sheila sent Tina home to be murdered. Eh, it's just nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. Uh, let's see what else you got to say here. Um, before I go on to my next thing here. Oh, okay. And Danny said, I looked at the pictures and she was naked from the waist down. Yes, that's true. Uh, she was naked. She was wearing a night, not like night thing. And and when she was gagged, they ripped the pants, panties off of her and gagged, pu pushed the panties in her mouth, which is not unusual. And then they took a bandana from one of the boys and, and tied it around her to shut her up because she probably was screaming. And then they taught, but her feet were tied. Everything was tied up. So, you know, it was not a sexual assault. Let me put it that way. Which, you know, I say she was perfectly fine looking 35 year old woman. So, yeah. Uh, Antini says, that was confused to me because the coroner said her skull was perfect. But the therapist said Martin said he killed a little girl with a hammer. Her, her, Martin did not kill the little girl with a hammer. She would, the hammer was never used on her. Whether Martin, again, we don't know why Martin said that. Was it because he didn't know and he was making up crap? He could have, the thing is he could be lying again in or out of truth when we don't know which one it is. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, why would he leave Justin in the house? The sister said he took the three kids out the window so they wouldn't see what they saw. I doubt Justin would go in the room and sleep if he had helped. Oh, the, one of the claims was that you know, that he could have helped his dad and then his dad let him go back to sleep. It's like, okay, go back and sleep and pretend nothing happened. That would be that would be kind of that would be kind of really super silly. Um, all right, so now let me go to John Douglas's his his um okay, hold on a second. His profile. Because I find this, oh, where do I find this? I don't know where to even say what I find this. Okay, let me find it. Um, you probably go missing on me again. Oh, for God's sake, stop going missing on me. There we go. All right. I'm also working on my cell phone. I mean, on my iPhone and my iPad, so much difficult. All right, so this, this is the John Douglas report. Following psychological profiles prepared by John Douglas of the FBI's Behavioral profile, Science Unit. All right, he says uh, it should be noted that just this profile is based upon certain probabilities. I hate probabilities, they suck. And a suspect developed by your department. What? I don't, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> right there. I don't base my profiles on suspects developed by a police department. That's nonsense because that means you're feeding me information and I'm not basing my profile on the evidence. I don't care who you think did it. I'm gonna look at the evidence and then give you my opinion. And it may fit the profile in part or whole. Oh. Okay, so my profile matches some of your suspects a little bit, that's a good thing. And if it matches it a lot, that's a better thing. <laughs> okay. 
Good Lord. Okay. I, I, I proceed. Uh, noting that the personal background of each of these victims. Oh, I see. Wait a minute. I'm trying to not get reflection in my glasses. Let me try it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I've been struggling with glass, glasses reflections, and I find it is annoying to watch that way. So I'm trying to keep it from happening, but it's not working really well. Okay. Okay. Never mind. Um, noting the personal background of each of these victims, they all could be ca ca categorized as high risk to be the recipient of a violent crime. All of them are high risk. What? Okay, Dana was kind of in trouble because in group home. I get that. I guess Sue was a, a whole bag according to somebody. <laughs> so she deserved to be killed. Um, Tina is 12 years old. There is some some suspicion. She had, she had this little incident where some guy, I guess some adult, had her sit on a bed and he kind of tried to molest her a little bit. And she pushed his hands away, and that was the end of that. She was high risk because she was. They claimed she was slow, that she was twelve, but she actually she, she looked smaller and she was she was in special ed classes, so she was a high risk victim. John, because he hung out with Dana. I don't know. I don't know what crap is. All right. So anyway. Oh, uh, so they could those who talk here about Dana, his previous antisocial acts came from a poor family. Uh, he's diabetic, which has nothing to do with being a high risk victim. And is known to have tortured animals. Who said that? And how and do we believe them? What? Wingate, that's Dana Wingate, that's the, the friend, uh, the, the young boy's friend, had a poor self image. While well, he was in a group home, I guess he kind of felt bad about life. And was involved in criminal offenses that may not have been known by police agencies. Well, <laughs> if they weren't known by police agencies, how do you know he's involved in criminal offenses? What the heck are you talking about? Oh my God. Including burglary and arson. That the police don't know about. But he did them. I'm, 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 I, I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little stunned here. The crime scene reflects that the offender responsible for these murders exhibited great control if he, in fact, acted alone, which he did not. It was somebody with him. The crime scene reflects that he did not precisely plan on killing all the victims. Okay, I'm, I'm with you there, Douglas. I, it didn't appear that that was the initial plan. I agree with that. All of the weapons appear to have come from the residence of the victims, the steak knife, the hammer, except there was a BB gun thing, which is kind of weird. Um, and indicates that killing the victim is probably an afterthought. Okay, I'm all right with that. In order for the subject to gain and maintain control of the victims, he would have had to have some assistance. Yeah, the second guy. <laughs> um, uh, Dana Wingate was not killed in the same fashion as the other two victims, beaten but not stabbed. It was made comfortable. Oh my God, God. Okay was made comfortable by receiving a cushion from the couch to rest his head on prior to his execution. This is not the clutter, clutter, is that their name? Clutter murders. In that, those murders, the killer claimed that he put a pillow under one, the, the older man's head because he wanted to make him comfortable if he killed him because he was a nice man. First of all, I don't know if that's true because it's a psychopath telling you that, it's a killer telling you that, don't believe everything you hear. Now let's take a look at this. At, at, oh, I don't have that picture because I don't want to show it to you. So that's not gonna help. But let me go into the house for just a second here, very vaguely. Okay, um, yeah, okay, you can't see it. Okay, you can see enough, okay, I'm gonna move away a little here. You see that couch right here? That pillow is missing. Now. The pillow, Wingate, Dana Wingate's head is laying on the corner of that big pillow. Okay? I am going to say that it is ludicrous that two vicious, violent people having a thrill out of tying up and, and bludgeoning and stabbing people to death give a crap that Dana has a comfy little pillow for his head. This is nonsense. And John Douglas, what the heck are you thinking? And why would you put that in there? Now, I'm going to tell you why I think that that, that cushion is missing. You got two guys in there pulling a knife on you and a hammer 
And if I were one of those boys and I'm just a, a boy and those are bigger guys, I'm going to grab that cushion and hold it in front of me to try to protect myself from getting stabbed or hammered to death. And when they hit me on the head of the hammer and I go down, I'm, my head is going to be on the pillow. Just go with what makes sense. Don't make these ridiculous statements. I, 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 I'm appalled. Absolutely appalled. I think it's a nonsense. Oh, thank God. All right. Then it says, Wingate might have been utilized to assist in the binding of the victims. That's possible. Sometimes what you do is say to one victim, uh, you bind him up or I'll kill you. Uh, let's say you put the knife to the uh, mom's throat and you say, hey, Dana, you bind up John. And he was kind of crappily bound up. So maybe he did have to bind up John. And then they bound up him just so they had control over three people. I'll go with that. All right. Blood is observed on the feet of Glenna Sharp, which is Sue Sharp, to indica indicate she was alive when she walked in a pool of blood. No, it doesn't. It indicates nothing of that sort. There is not one solid proof that there were footprints, that she stepped in something, and then there are footprints on the floor. Nonsense. What you do see is that her feet are very next to where the blood is on the pillow. So it's very likely that she had turned and her feet went down on the blood on the pillow and then she was pushed, she either rolled back over or somebody pushed her over. There's no proof that she was ever standing in any blood ever. There's nothing in that room that indicates to me that anybody was well attacked or was bleeding heavily before they were bound. Now they might've been hit once, threatened once and slashed a little bit, but everybody was bound before they were then stabbed and hammered to death. So the blood is mostly down on the floor, except for what the weapons are flicking around, you know, because you're whacking, doing this kind of stuff. But there's no evidence that there was heavy blood on the floor and she walked through the blood and then, no, that's garbage. And I don't know where you got it from, John Douglas. I do not understand it. All right. Now. <sighs> All right. The terrible homicide, he goes on. Okay, okay, calm down here a minute. Oh, he says about, about the blood on her feet. Oh, noting that this information could modify this modify this profile. Okay, which I don't know what that means. According to investigative reports, Glenna Sharp, which is Sue Sharp, was covered with a blanket after she was killed. This blanket came from her bed. This one act on the part of the offender, which you do not know John Douglas, because you do not know that the offender did that, but you, or why he did that, is probably the key to who's responsible for the murders in part or whole. No, it has no meaning whatsoever. <laughs> because if he pulled, if the, if the little girl came out with the blanket over her, because she was hiding under it, and they pulled the blanket from her and chucked it over her mother, it doesn't prove a damn thing. This terrible homicide appears to be without any motive. Neither sex nor money was the motivating factor. Okay, I agreed that sex at the scene wasn't the motivating factor. They didn't have a lot of money, so, but who knows? Maybe they thought they had something there worth stealing. The crime scene reflects anger and rage on one hand and remorse and guilt. No, it does not show any remorse or guilt because they're claiming that's why the blanket was put over the mom because they felt bad about killing the mom. <sighs> no. It appears at this point that there is more than one murder involved in the triple homicide. Yes, we know that. Uh, the offender responsible for this triple homicide did not initially plan on killing. It was an afterthought as evidenced by the weapons selected. Okay. All weapons could be referred to as weapons of opportunity. I agree again, except for that weird BB gun thing. This offender knew his victims, particularly John and Glenna Sharp. No, he, where's the proof he knew his victims? Where'd you pull that out of a hat? What, what is the proof he knew them? I don't see where it is at the scene. It was Tina Sharp who probably went to her mother's bedroom. Okay, they were sleeping in the same room. What, after she was killed and got a blanket from her bed. No, Tina, supposedly they were in the same bedroom. I, I think that mom said to Tina, hide. I don't know what the hell's going on out there, but you just stay quiet, hide under that damn blanket. And she went out to see what was going on. And then all hell continued. And then her daughter eventually, either the guys went into the room and brought her out or she came out. Um, but Tina did not go to her bed, pick up a blanket, and then cover her mother. Oh, come on. Really? Tina Sharp, at 12 years of age, may have had conflicts with her mother, like many pre-adolescent girls at that age. 
What does that have to do with the tea in China? Okay. However, since the homicide, since she has probably demonstrated a great deal of remorse and guilt. Oh, now John Douglas is saying she was in on the homicide, that she was running away with the guy who killed off her family. Now, mind you, teenage girls sometimes will get their boyfriend to kill their family. But this is a 12-year-old girl and two dudes. I'm not thinking that she has found a guy who's going to get rid of her family so she can run away. Holy God almighty. Ah. If Tina Sharp is alive, because at this point, John Douglas did not know she was dead, uh, she'll find that she'll be able to become increasingly depressed on significant anniversaries and holiday dates, like her mother's birthday, her own birthday, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. Her depression will cause her to seek out her father. I mean, the one that they ran away from? Okay. And as well as the gravesite of her mother and brother, uh, because we all have to seek out gravesites. Okay. It should be noted that information received by the BSU, that's the Behavioral Science Unit, is that the father had an alibi at the time of the homicides and not a suspect. Tina Sharp may have already attempted to locate her mother's place of burial, may have visited the burial site. Good God almighty, the child was dead. <laughs> this is a 12-year-old. She not, isn't necessarily running around trying to find out where mommy was buried. Oh, my Lord. All right. It gets worse. The offender demonstrated control and confidence, and therefore he's not a juvenile. I agree. Nor is he free of any police record. We do not know that. He is, it is saying that like absolute is ridiculous. He is fixated on young females, which he had, what? And has been involved with them in the past. What? Be it for sex or for personal pro, pro, profit like child pornography. John Douglas, you are no better than a psychic because you're making up a whole bunch of crap based on absolutely nothing at the crime scene. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Okay. <sighs> so they're looking for, now he goes on about how they should look for Tina. Basically, what he's saying is that Tina was the target, that Tina and some guy she wanted to run away with. That's the guy and his buddy that killed everybody. And then Tina escaped went away with that guy on purpose and then eventually she would be so sad she did what she did she got her family killed and she would feel remorse but then three years later her body was found and she'd been dead all along and that's why criminal profiling has gotten such a bad rap because if this like the most number one guy criminal profiler Writes profiles like this. Oh, I mean, I cannot. Oh, I cannot. Okay, I'm going to check your comments. I'm going to go to where I think the most important information about this crime is and the most likely suspects, in my opinion. All right. Oh, sorry. Oh. The conflict, Jim says, the conflicts wouldn't matter while her mom was being killed. Well, you know, there are those crazy teen girls. You know, they do. They do get their boyfriend because... It, but that's when their parents object to them being with their boyfriend. Like 17 year old girl, she's got 22 year old boyfriend who's a criminal and a creeple, you know? And she's like, they won't let us be together. They say, I can't see you anymore. And then she gets creepo boy to come in with a sword and slash up the family. That I believe. This is a 12 year old, slightly slow girl who, as far as we know, has nobody in her life. She's got no boyfriend. She had one little incident with somebody trying to be inappropriate with her. Hey, so did I when I was that age. That didn't make me go kill my family. <laughs> she had her brothers, her brothers, her sisters, her mom. That's all she knew. She wasn't even around her father. And she's, what, she's going to run away with some pedophile? I mean, yeah. Unbelievable. Yes. Sounds like a lot of crazy theories out there, but not based on evidence. I don't even know where John Douglas got this crap from. I swear to God, it was like, it, it literally isn't better than psychics. And I, I find it appalling, absolutely appalling. Um, maybe a 17-year-old would want to run away with some guy, but 12 years old, yeah, yeah, exactly. I can't I can't fathom that. Um, let's go back to what some of you else have said. Um, oh, yeah, this too. And Dini says, there are so many horrible things said about Tina. They even said she was pregnant. Yeah, there's no proof she was pregnant. Uh, there's, I, I can't quite figure out the oldest sister, Sheila, supposedly had gotten pregnant, therefore Tina might be pregnant. And so the guy who got Tina pregnant was coming to take her away and killing the family. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. 
Um, let's see what Benny says. Now I'm sitting here with Pat teaching me how to profile with Jack in my hand. Jack Daniels to Magna. <laughs> hmm. And you got music in the background. I don't have that. Oh, hold on a second. My, my foot is just falling asleep. Oh my God. That's unfortunate. All right. It's, it's a horrible, I'm sitting on a, a, a really hard rectangle piece of wood that is cutting into my legs. <laughs> oh, if I stand up now, I'm going to actually fall up because my leg is asleep. Oh, this is very unfortunate. Um, oh, okay. All right. Let's t let me check this one out. Leslie says, if Kenny is isolated, then either the killers are local, maybe. Maybe someone thought there were valuables of drugs there, maybe. Or maybe not. All right. Now I want to go to... I want to go to my theories on this. Hold on a second. <laughs> my leg is gone. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. It's, it's like the torture, torture chair. Okay. This is where I want to go. And this, I want to point out th two things that to me are the most important parts of this case. <sighs> One, the mother was not sexually assaulted. So if the mother wasn't sexually assaulted, this was either a revenge killing uh, or a thrill kill or a kidnapping of the girl. The girl is 12 years old and slow. I'm going to say, if you weren't from anybody from town, you pretty much could grab that girl any old time. You didn't need to kill an entire family to grab that kid. She's probably walking around by herself all over the place. You just snatch her. Okay, so... Nobody went into that home with the intention of snatching that girl because it's stupid. Secondly, there's a whole hell of a lot of people in that house. And, and, and most people, when they want to commit a crime, do not want to go to a place where there's two, three, four, five, six, seven people. <laughs> Unless they don't know there's seven people there. Definitely the, the Marty guy, Justin's father, would know how many people would be in that house. And that would be a really stupid time to go kill off Sue because he was pissed off at her. Again, Marty would know where Sue was. He could probably just say, hey, Sue, come on. I want to meet you down here. And she'd probably go. And then he could kill her someplace else or give her a ride, kill her someplace else. So to me, Sue is not the target. Neither was a little girl. In that case, what the hell is a target? Good question. All right. The next piece of information, keep that in mind. Who's the target then under those weird circumstances where the body of Tina was found? This to me is the big massive issue here. All right, let me show you that picture again about where Tina was found. All right, Tina is found. All right, this is Katie. You go through a whole bunch of, it takes you three Almost four hours to get to this damn location uh, in, in the middle of freaking nowhere. Uh, it's actually a place called, um, oh, hold on a second, sorry. <laughs> My butt is numb. All right, let me, the place that they're actually in uh, is, is a is a incredibly isolated location. Let me tell you what people say about that location. Okay, let me find it here. All right. By the way, I didn't mention this. This is what Justin said the guys looked like. Uh, some local guy did this and people were pissed that they didn't get a professional in there. But I don't know if Justin really saw them well and if it would have been any better otherwise. But anyway, all right, now. All right, this is where Tina's skull was found. It was in a, an area of a, this camping area, resting on, a ground, on the ground by a pile of logs, a point of reference of the location's old boy car. Having never been to this place myself, I have no idea what it means, but apparently means something to locals. It did appear that someone had just come along and set it down. She wasn't buried in a shallow grave or anything, just she, her body was just dumped there. Next to a pile of logs. Her other bones were quite further away, which means it's possible that animals had dragged her skull to where it lay. This is true. However, it didn't appear to have been there that long. That's not true. Uh, covered by debris or bleached much from the sun. Uh, they. Some people thought the body had not been there for three years, that Tina had been taken somewhere and kept and then killed later. I don't know the accuracy of the pathologist, what they think, how long her body had been there, the forensic anthropologist. So I, I don't know, trust that whether they really been there for three entire years or less. 
Let's see what else they have to say. I'm oh, sorry, that's not it. Okay, where did the rest go? Oh, uh, there was a really, where did it go? Hold on a second, I've lost it. Uh, 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 I've lost it. Okay, here we go. From what I've learned about the location itself, it is very hard to get to, remote and not easy to find. You wouldn't, as we've agreed, just come upon it by chance. You'd have to know it. Given that this location is known only as a place loggers go to chop, chop wood, wouldn't this mean that the killer has a connection to the forest industry? I don't know that the killer has a connection to the forest industry, but this is the point. It's a very isolated location. When you're looking at a crime like this, when you're talking about murders, they go to dump bodies in places that they feel comfortable dumping bodies, places that they feel the body's not going to be found, or places that they feel they're not going to be seen, or places that they know, or places that they drive near. Now, this is Ketty. It's almost almost four hours to this location, down really crappy roads. Wouldn't you think that it, the most important thing would be to find out who that could have committed this crime would know this place? Because otherwise, why would he waste his time going there? I mean, if you're in Ketty and you want to dump the body, you just dump the body down the road. I mean, you know, and all the body, uh, there's three dead bodies in the house, brutally murdered. Why not kill the girl there? Or if you're going to ch choke her up later, why not just dump her on the side of the road someplace else? What does it matter? Why would she be all the way from here, all the way down here, all the way around to Feather Falls? That's a hell of a long way. So there's got to be a reason you're here. This is just not normal for anybody to be at that location. So my number one clue is who knows that place? Who would go by that place for some reason? Okay. Now, do I believe that Tina was kidnapped to be kidnapped? I don't believe that. I believe it was a thrill kill and they didn't even know Tina was there till later. And then when they found Tina was there, they decided to take her. They could have taken her because they thought, hey, she is a cute little thing and we'll take her with us and eventually have fun with her. They could have taken her as a hostage. Who knows why they did it? We don't know. But they could have killed her there. But my theory is that, that once they did their throat kill and she showed up, they just said, hey, let's grab her and go with her. And they did. Obviously, they did. Now, when we come down to Justin's father, Marty, he lived right next door. What the hell is he doing all the way down here? Supposedly, he was at home burning up shit. And nobody said he left town. So how the hell did the little girl get all the way down here if Marty was still at home? Wife didn't say he left town for two days. You know, he eventually did go away to Reno, but that would mean he'd have to keep the child nearby uh, and some kind of, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, well, the wife tries to claim that, yeah, he kept her in uh, captivity. But then again, Reno is not down here. Reno is way over here. So why the hell did he just dump her on the way to Reno? Why would he go to Heather Falls? I'll tell you why, because it's not probably not him. All right, now I'm going to introduce you to a couple suspects that almost nobody talks about. All right. The guy's name is Henry Thompson. And let me tell you about Henry Thompson and his buddy. All right. Now it's interesting because I was over at uh, Ken Main's site just because I want to see what he had to say. And he said he's felt really sorry for this guy. Because this guy says he and his friend went in and gave the police some information about a van they saw in town that night at a certain location. And, and they, then they got harassed and they were questioned and they were like, hey, you know, I just came in to give information. Now I'm being a, now I'm suspected of committing the crime. I got to go through polygraphs. This guy was really pissed. And Kim Ain said, I feel sorry for him. I don't feel sorry for him. And I'll tell you why I don't feel sorry for him. First of all, Kim Ains, read up on the dude. <laughs> He wasn't just a guy that just happened to be in town and, and this happened. Okay, this guy, okay, his name is, um, let me get his name straight here. Um, his name is, okay, hold on a second, let me find. 
Okay, his name is Charles Walkie. Walk. It's not actually Walkie. It's not W A L K I E. It's W A L K E. All right. And this guy, Henry. Henry Thompson is his buddy. Henry Thompson and this guy, Charles Walkie. Walkie. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Uh, also known as Chuck, were in town that night. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this? He said. Apparently, Chuck, this guy here, had a friend down in a place called Livermore. He claims that he and his buddy, Henry, went down to Livermore the day before and then came back up to, to uh, Kitty. All right, let me show you. Remember those, remember those uh, maps I showed you? Let me show you the maps. All right, let's take a look at Livermore. Uh, is it here? Okay, wait a minute. Sorry, got the wrong map. Okay. All right. Down here, you're going to see. So down here, you see Livermore. You see how you come up here? And it goes past Feather Falls. Oh, yeah, it does. Now look over on this side. Now this says San Jose down here, but it's really Livermore because it's just a shitty map. Okay, you go up here. You see that little wiggle off the road? That's Feather Falls. You go, keep going up here, that's Ketty. What's on the way between Livermore and Ketty? Feather Falls. That's what's on the way. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, now let me tell you a little bit about these fellas. Let me show you just a couple things and I'm going to read for you. All right. All right, so they went down to Livermore. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, that's not what I want to read you. All right, and well, that's not what I want. To, okay, all right. I just want to point out before I read you the stuff about this. This is in the this is in the records of the police. This is police records. Uh, they they went to Thompson's residence on Lee Road. Blah blah blah. This is um this fellow here, Tom, Henry Thompson, got fed up. He said with people teasing. He worked for the railroad. Uh, that people were teasing him, calling him the Keddy Machette. And names like that. And out of anger, he said he may have told people at work that he actually did kill the victims. All right. He, there's a confession here. He claimed to the guys at work, yeah, okay, I killed them. Now, could he have just been joking around? Sure. But when you talk about the police being unfair to these two characters, because they said they saw this van and now they're under suspicion. Let me read you the whole story. All right. Let me find it. The whole story about these two guys. This is just, oh, now you're going to be amazed at what this is. Now, I'm not saying these guys committed the crime. I'm saying that boy, oh boy, there's a reason why the police looked at them and their connection to Livermore to me is very interesting. All right. So this is what happened. Oh, wait a minute. I have one more picture here for you. I'll put that up just so you can see this. This is what that fella said. This, remember, they had a friend in Livermore, and then he said, nobody's ever going to find the girl's body. Why? Because it's in Feather Falls in a place which nobody should know where it is? Mm. What suspected never to be found. Okay, let me read this to you. This railroad worker... That would be Henry Thompson, okay, uh, was in Livermore, as you saw, down the way, which passes by Heather Falls. He was in Livermore the night of the murders. Now, this is supposedly way earlier, and it's a hell of a long drive from Livermore back up to Ketty, and you wonder why you would drive that many hours, but okay. The two went to Tom S.'s house in Ketty. I believe Tom S., um, I think that was the, he used to live actually in cabin 28 before he moved to another cabin. Uh, they, they went to Tom S.'s house in Ketty where there was a party going on involving the use of LSD. The railroad worker and the subject uh, that gave him the ride then went to the Sharp house where they started playing a game with the victims and the subject that gave the railroad worker a ride ride tied up the victims. 
The caller said that the informant, drinking buddy of the railroad worker, had no further information except that the railroad worker said it only started out as a game. All right. The caller said he would identify himself, but I don't know that ever did. All right. They said that the railroad worker was very upset and nervous when telling him of the incident. Based on previous supplemental reports on Chuck W., this guy, and Henry Thompson, and the person that gave him a ride back from Livermore. Oh, so this guy was the one doing all the driving. Took back and forth from Livermore. All right. Uh, Henry is questioned after the police learned that they were both in Keddy on the morning of 4 12 81. They were in the town early morning. And I mean early morning by midnight, one o'clock, 2 a.m., exactly when this murder went down, without a really good explanation of why. In 1981, they said it was to go by Henry's brother-in-law's house who lived behind cabin 28. Years later in the documentary, Chuck says it was to go by his girlfriend's house for breakfast and coffee. Okay, in 1981, Chuck said they saw a truck at the store on Highway 70, but Henry said they saw a truck at the Keddie store. They can't get the story straight. So the roommate who reported this to the police felt he, Henry was telling the truth and wanted to get it off his chest. Henry told the police that he told this lie because he was being tired of being called the Keddie Machete. And interesting, these are things the police looked at in 1981, but people today skip right over them. Yes, they are skipping right over them. They are so busy with these two guys that they're ignoring these two guys. Now I say, is it more likely that these two guys, knowing there are seven people in the house, when they could have attacked Sue any old time, when the, and there's no reason they were kidnapping the kid, they could have done that, they could have attacked Sue without all those people in the house, and with Justin in the house as well, to identify. And there's no evidence actually linking them, in spite of the fact that the police are right at their house and right at the car, his vehicle, and yet, not a shred of evidence. There had to be blood everywhere. Whoever killed those people in the house, they had blood on their clothes. And they got in a vehicle that had to leave blood in the vehicle. And they took a child away with them. And there's none of that evidence linking to this guy in spite of the fact he's a, oh, a psychopath. And this guy's not so great either. <laughs> but these guys were in town for reasons they can't explain. They were right next to the house. They even said they were right next to the house that this all went down in. And they and they left town. And they their route went by Feather Falls. And the guy who was in, his buddy said they'd never find the body. Okay. And on top of that, let's look at the last thing about this. I don't know how they ended up at that house. I don't know how those two boys ever got home from when they were hitchhiking. There's one claim someplace a woman gave them a ride late at night, but I don't know that I buy that. There's no, I can't find any evidence of that. Who gave them the ride home? Maybe these two guys? Is that how they actually ended up at the, the house? Because they gave the boys a ride home? A lot of people suspect that whoever gave them the ride were the killers. And that would not be unlikely. It does sound like, the whole thing sounds like a thrill kill to me, since they weren't raping the woman. They were more like having fun with the guys, getting you know, messing with them and then tying them up. And then that could, kind of like the, you know, the clutter case. They just, they went wild on them. And then they found out there was a kid there and they took her. Kid was not the target. Sue was not the target. I think it's a thrill kill gone wrong. Um, maybe they didn't plan the whole entire thing out, but it all ended up badly because maybe they were, they were high on something. Don't know. But if I'm going to pick a suspect, the evidence doesn't point to these guys in spite of the nonsense that this guy said. The evidence points over here. Now, I'm not saying these two guys did it. But they were in town. Their stories don't work. And they were on their way to and from Livermore, which was on the route that goes by where the body of the little girl was found. And I say where the body of the little girl was found is the key to this crime. And if somebody can prove that these two jerks had any connection to Feather Falls 
and had the time to drive four hours away and mess around with all that, let me know. Because these guys actually did go by that place. So anyway, those are my thoughts on this crime. Uh, now, let me let me see what you have to say. Hold on, I can't fix my butt. Oh my God. Oh, that hurts. <sighs> this is the worst seat ever. I don't know why anybody would make a yeah, this hard receipt to sit on, but it's not comfy. Okay, let me see what you have to say. Have a drink. Mm. All right, where am I at here? And by the way, if you're still here and you haven't been here before, please do subscribe to the channel. Okay. Okay. Um, um, Benny, Elisa says, I think the suitmate could still be the target, but the boys came back, the dynamics changed. He wanted the victims to be tied up because it's easier to control them. But his that this guy, let's go back to this character here. All right. Um, Sue's the target. But see, this guy knows that family. He knows about the boys coming and going. He had no proof that the boys weren't going to be there. So he would go, he comes out of a, uh, he comes out of the bar at two o'clock in the morning and decides to go over there and kill Sue. And then gets caught by the two boys, but he knows his son is there and the two other boys are there and probably the other girl is there. <sighs> really? He has too many opportunities to kill on, on other circumstances. That, that's why I, I just, I just don't buy it. And not one shred of physical evidence. Uh, of course, there are those who say because he, the sheriff was nice to him, that the sheriff it's a pretty huge cover-up. Nah, I'm not going to go with that. Um, um, again, oh, I think we talked about this. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, people, there are vagrants who come through. There are ones who go from town to town, and know people in different towns. Um, the kind of crime is more of a... Few, uh, somehow few, a drug fueled crime or a thrill fueled crime or just a one of those crap crimes um and it could either, it could be somebody in town but it's just as easy as somebody coming through um because if you do that and you're in town you're still sitting there right there it's not very it's not a good idea to be there um dana was not bound what dana was heavily bound i don't know what you're talking about he was bound um, he wasn't bound as well, <laughs> mind you. Um, he was bound that, that there was, um, uh, Justin, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, John was bound better. John had his hands wrapped with, uh, tape, uh, medical tape. Um, and he had his feet bound really well. Um, it's, uh, it's, he was bound, but crappily. So either he got out of his uh, bindings and he was also, his feet were bound to John's feet. So... I don't know what that really means. It could mean that they made John bind Dana and did a lousy job. <laughs> the two of them did different guys and one of them wasn't as good. Don't know. Don't know. <laughs> yes, that's true. Elisa says, pillow for comfort, but I'll knock out your teeth later on. Yeah, his teeth are smashed out. The pillow is not for comfort. I mean, you could do it as a humor thing, but you wouldn't do it for comfort or you felt bad. Uh, Kelly says, a Douglas guy from the FBI sounds like he really wasn't a good profiler. <sighs> John Douglas is considered the number one profile in the United States. And it's not like I want, like to speak badly about other profilers because I want to push the profiling industry. But I will honestly say this, and well, it's my opinion. So I don't know if you want to call it honestly. People say that and then you're like, yeah, you're lying. <laughs> yeah. I want to say this. I have had more problems with John Douglas's profiles and his profiling methodology and his books than any other profile. I just have. And I find that he's been a detriment in the long run to the scientific aspect of profiling. Uh, I'm opposed to the way he profiles and the way FBI has presented profiling. And I want that to change because I want profiling to be something that is scientific and logical and not just the FBI guys can do, but many people can do. Like you become a lawyer or a doctor, you should be able to become a crime scene analyst and profiler by learning skills and not by some magical bullcrap or that, you know, you know 
you can, I don't know, you can get inside the mind of a killer and, you know, and, and all this nonsense. Um, it's, 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 it's done a disservice. In the beginning, the whole concept of the FBI was studying serial homicides and stuff. That was grand. But then it took a bad turn in which they became the overlords uh, that they thought they were the only ones that could do this. And no other profile that was worth their, worth their salt. And I've had them say nothing but nasty things about me. Uh, just call me that TV lady like, I have no ability to profile because I didn't go through the FBI. And I think that's nonsense. I, I think that it should be a legitimate program you could teach in a university. Um, study it. Study how to profile. Study how to analyze crime. And then you learn methodology and you become useful. I don't think you, there's only like nine guys in the FBI who can say, oh, we are profiles and nobody else is. That's just ridiculous. It's like saying you can't have more than nine teachers in the world, nine lawyers in the world, nine doctors in the world, nine engineers in the world. What kind of crap is this? Nine detectives in the world. Of course not. We need lots of them and we need them to be skilled. So I, I, I'm very, very upset with what the FBI has done and what John Douglas has done too. Basically, in my opinion, represent uh, criminal profiling in a, in a very, very unfortunate way. Um, <laughs> well, and eh, Douglas probably does. Uh, well, you know, he's in with the media really well. Um, and, you know, when he puts a book out, he gets, you know, the uh, any book he puts out is going to be published with the top publisher. And then all the reviewers from the from the New York Times and the Washington Post well, are going to go rah, rah, rah. Um, he's got a good publicity team. Um, and I it, I wouldn't mind it so much. Like, I, I, I don't have an issue with Robert Ressler. Robert Ressler is another one of the original FBI profilers. I like Robert Ressler. I think he's done some good work um, he, and he's not overly oh, egotistical. Um, and so I kind of like him. Um, and I don't I don't dislike you if you're an FBI profiler or if you're not an uh, independent profiler. I just want you to understand that you should be promoting the scientific and logical method of profiling. And no, I don't know what the, this stuff that he did in this profile is astoundingly awful. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm like, what the, what are you even talking about? I don't know where you even get your crap from. Because, he's, and this is my point with everything. If you're going to say something, you have to say what evidence leads you to believe that. Again, profiling is, should be used for helping the police determine the best leads they should follow, the best avenues of investigation. It isn't about us being right or wrong. It's helping just uh, focus an investigation. But if you put out crap like this, I don't know, I, I really don't know what the purpose of that was. Um, here, I'm only trying to educate you on how things work. Um, I'm not working with the police. I don't have all the inside information. I don't have every interview, every piece of evidence. If I were working with the police on this case, I'd have certain opinions. By the way, they do claim they have some evidence. Now, by the way, these, these guys are both dead. Um, so uh, they do claim they have this new team that went, is uh, working on it, claims they have some evidence lead that is... Um, uh, links to a live person. Some people say it's his son, Justin, that his DNA was on a piece of the medical tape and therefore Justin helped co commit the crimes. I don't know. If, I don't know any of the truth on any of that. Um, the old sheriff doesn't think these guys did it. I don't know because I'm not there and I don't have all the evidence. Let's see. Um, oh, we already went there. Let's see. Um, Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Benny. Uh, yeah, except the killer would be in for a surprise. As Pat knows, I'm a bit of an undercover killer myself. So it'll make an interesting <laughs> Only if I go, to, only if you have a submarine, I go to Denmark. Ah. Um, Kelly says, wow, that profile of John Douglas makes me wonder about any common sense this guy may have. Holy cow. I, I was stunned by this. Um, most of the profiles the FBI does never see the light of day because it's, a, it's, it's, to, it's to your advantage to never have them be public so that you can't be proven wrong. <laughs> this one, 
Should, if I were them, I would have buried this sucker. <laughs> I really would have buried it. That was like the one of the worst profiles I've ever seen. Huh? Like unbelievable. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, oh, is what are his credentials? Oh my God, Benny. John Douglas's credentials are what everybody would think a profile's credentials should be. He was an agent with the FBI. Oh, hold on a second again. Oh my God, I gotta move my butt. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> So it's a big, huge, like like a razor sharp edge on this little stool thing I'm sitting on. I sit someplace else, but there is no uh, there's no other choices in this particular location. So um, and he was an agent with the FBI. And by the way, if you want to become a profiler with the FBI, take heed. You just don't go into the FBI and say, I want to be a criminal profiler. You have to be an agent for like two decades. Kind of like when you want to be a detective with the police, you have to be a, a regular police person a patrol person before you get to ever get, maybe, and you may never get there to be a detective or a profiler. Uh, and then at a certain point, like 10 years, 20 years later, you might get the opportunity if they like you. Uh, I think I think Douglas did go and get some, uh, get some more uh, credentials through college. Um, and then he became a profiler and he worked at the Behavioral Science Unit. Um, and people will say, for example, that he's got all his credentials because he's with the FBI. It's an FBI profile. Pat Brown, as they claim, is that TV lady uh, or that fraud, uh, whatever they try to claim. Um, apparently, um, you know, I have a master's degree in criminal justice, which I pretty much think is garbage, but <laughs> I have one. Um, I did a tremendous amount of studies on my own, studying every aspect of criminal profiling and, and, and criminal uh, uh psychopathology. Um, I studied forensic pathology. I studied a massive amount of stuff on my own outside of the, the programs and also went to seminars and so forth. Um, and then I've worked in the field for many years, although many people say I haven't. Um, and I also developed the first criminal profiling uh, certificate, uh, certificate program for criminal profiling in the country. But I couldn't take that program because I developed it, so I don't have the certificate. <laughs> So it's my program, but I don't have a certificate from it. So you see, <laughs> the problem is there's no absolute uh, credentials for this for this particular job. And so there's these huge arguments over it. And I, personally, I don't really care what the arguments are. I want to know that you're using a logic um, and, and scientific method, and you're honest about what the profiling is. Uh, and we don't have to, we don't have to say, if you're an FBI profile, you suck, or if you're an independent profile, you suck, or whatever. You don't have to do that. We, it would be nice if we developed more credentials in a, in a, in a proper way. Uh, we just haven't done it yet, and so therefore I don't think we should be pointing fingers. You can be good no matter what, but I at least want you to present the evidence and say, if you're going to give a profile, you have to say where you got that information from. When I say... I, I think the number one point here is the evidence that the girl's body was found in a remote place, which nobody should know, that this, the killer has to have a knowledge of that place. Because, it, you know, killers don't work like they just drive around 400 miles to find some location in the mountains and dump a body. That's not the way they work. They pick some place they're comfortable with that they know or is on their way. Those three things, and sometimes all together. That's why I think Feather Falls is important. Now, I'm giving you that evidence and I'm giving you my explanation for my determination. I'm not just going, I don't know, just, <laughs> just coming up with nothing out of nothing. I mean, that's what bugs me. It's like, oh, this they, clearly they wanted to kidnap just the girl. Okay, if you're gonna say that, tell me why. Tell me why they couldn't kidnap the girl someplace else. If she's only 12 years old and she wanders around, why didn't she just kidnap her off the road? or out in front of her house. Why would you kill a whole family to kidnap one little girl? Give me, your, give me your explanation here. Oh, there isn't one because you're not going to give the explanation. That's my problem. I want to see your explanation. I don't, if you're gonna come up with something, fine. I may not agree with you, but at least I want your explanation. And you may not agree with me, but at least you should have my explanation. That's the purpose of profiling. When you tell the detectives why they should look in a certain direction, you should be able to explain to them clearly this is the evidence. This is why I've determined this. Now you can accept it or not, but at least I give you a clear explanation because I don't want you wasting your time running down some road 
when you have no clue whether that makes any sense. And I'm telling you, oh, you should just you should just go down that road because Pat Brown told you to go down that road, or John Douglas told you to go down that road. Who are we? I mean, <laughs> and if we can't explain ourselves, we shouldn't be listened to. We shouldn't be. So. Lila says, maybe at 17, I want to run away with some guy, but 12, that's pretty young. Yeah, that is definitely pretty young. Um, oh, oh, that's an interesting one. And Danny, good question. What do you think about the knife holes in the wall? Well, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, my poor butt. Okay. Okay. Um, the claim is that he liked to throw knives. <laughs> now, I don't know how I, well, here's what I would do. First of all, I don't know about the knife holes in the wall. What kind of knife holes are, if I took a knife and, went, and or found somebody who could throw knives better than me, and I go, do I have the proper depth in the wall for throwing knives? Or are we talking about somebody picking up a knife and going, pop, pop, pop. Now, why would they do that? I can think of two reasons, which is way more likely than throwing knives at the wall. Um, amusement. Okay, sometimes when you're, when you're moving around and you're you're like agitated, maybe you're on something, you just go, hey, dude, you know, hey, huh, huh, huh. You just do that to amuse yourself because you got the knife in your hand. Or you go, or you could be saying, you know what I'm going to do to you? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. I'd go with those two. Those two are much more likely than anybody's a knife thrower, which is what they tried to come up with. I think it's just amusement. Um, Lila, I thought they just thought they'd have themselves some fun before they off the last one, the little girl. They didn't offer though. She was not killed in the house. There's no evidence she was killed in the house. They took her from the house. Um, I don't think they were after the little girl. I don't even, I personally don't think they know the little girl was there. That's another thing. If it was him, he'd know the little girl was in there probably, unless she was staying over at the other girl's house. He might've thought she was staying at the other, you know, because sometimes they did stay together. I don't think the person knew the little girl was there either way. I think that was a surprise. I think mom told her, stay hot, stay hidden, stay low. I'm going to go out and try to see what's going on. And the little girl only ended up coming out later because she was forced to or because she finally panicked and ran out. Uh, I don't think they had a clue about her. I don't think that was their purpose. I really don't. Uh, I think they were like, oh, oh crap, we got a little girl. We got 12 of her. She's cute. <laughs> Let's just take her. I don't see that this was something they were doing to then to get to her at all because she would have then been raped and murdered in the house and then they didn't do that. Um, uh, pathologist said he believed she died shortly after she was taken because her bones were that of a child. No, he didn't. Uh, that's not what I saw. I, he actually said that he thought that she was um, 12 years old, which she was, but she was actually a small child, so her bones might not have actually looked like a 12-year-old. Later on, he said he thought she was like only there for a year and a half to two years, which would mean that she was kept alive for a year and a half or so, or a, or a year. Um, but that she was a child was no question. But personally, I don't think she lasted long. I think she was killed on the way back. They might have, they might have pulled over and raped her and then strangled her and then dumped her, but I don't think anything more than that. Person, I don't think she was held in any place. Um, <laughs> I'm back. I had to feed my cat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was a little aggressive cat. It's like, feed me. Wow. 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 Um, someone who knew the area. Well, someone who does know the area, but, you know, people drive around in those areas. Uh, a lot of people are on the road a lot more than people realize that they like to go from place to place to place because, they, you know, there's not much of doing any of the places that they live in. <laughs> so they move around. Uh, but that they lived in the town is not necessarily so. Um, let's see. Um, uh, 
Oh no, did I, really? Did I get frozen? Yes, the two, two of them are vets. And as a matter of fact, uh, 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 the, this, this guy, um, Marty, Marty actually, it was kind of funny. He claimed to a psychiatrist that he, he had, uh, you know, PSTD, um, PTSD, when I forgot, PTSD, did I say that backwards? PTSD, uh, and then it turned out he was just a cook and he was nowhere near the front lines. And so how did he have PTSD? So he's a liar and yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, oh, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be curious to see you saying, uh, you missed the first bit about the subject, which is the most important thing of this show, uh, but I will see if I need to, uh, I'll, I'll check it out later after after it processes and see if I need to do something to fix it up, uh, which is very frustrating. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes you have, there's nothing I can do about those kind of um, technical errors, which are, are, are just based on uh, whatever the internet does. But I didn't see it on this end at all. Usually I see if something goes wrong. <laughs> But I'll see later, and then if, if necessary, I'll have my son fix it as much as he can. But I, I really hope that um, yeah, that sucks. I was frozen for a couple of minutes. Is two minutes too long? Because that was the important part of the show. Because I wanted people to understand that that uh, that these these guys are are far better are far better um far better suspects than the ones that everybody thinks did it. Um, I don't know, I'm gonna to wait to see whether, uh, what the new evidence comes out, uh, who the evidence points to, if anybody at all. But I'm gonna say the guys that came and went from Livermore are far better suspects than Marty and his buddy Bo. So anyway, that's gonna be it for now. Uh, I'm gonna check later and see what happened to my, my transmission. Uh, but I'm glad you were here. Uh -oh all here. <laughs> now I can't speak. Oh, I don't know if it's my butt or my frustration over the transmission or it's Magna beer from only I'm only, but it really, really, I've only had this much. <laughs> Magna beer, the beer of Puerto Rico. So anyway, I will see you. I will see you soon. Uh, next uh, Wednesday or Thursday for the hangout. Not sure which day yet, but hopefully I will see you there. And, uh, yeah, until then, I will be on a plane heading back to uh, back to Maryland, uh, but I don't get to leave till 11 at night on Spirit Airways, so it's just a day of hell. That's all I can say. It's going to be a day of hell, and I'm not going to have a good time. So, oh well, I uh, will be back in Maryland soon and uh, drinking local brew. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> More problems. I'm clicking all the wrong things now. Bye.